I'm happy to introduce the lectures. Uh, this uh, the lectures of to the lecture of today, and uh, which is really listed on your bulletin. And uh, the fourth one and the final one: How can short-term missions be better? Before I introduce our lecturer, our speaker, may I recognize? Now, it's a few people who came from afar, and uh, I just met a gentleman here who said he drove for 150 miles all the way from Winston-Salem to come and listen to that priest. And uh, yes, his family is here. And others have traveled maybe shorter distances uh, to be here today amidst this rain and the way the weather is changing, but we're glad we are here. These lectures are sponsored by the Fig Tree Fellowship, which has been sponsoring this type of lectures, the mission of the church lectures for several years. May I recognize uh, any member of the Fig Tree Fellowship here, please? If you are here, can you raise your hand? Very good. We want to thank, yes, right there. We want to thank you for your commitment uh, to, the, to these lectures, the mission of the church lectures. We appreciate all the work you've done because without you, these lectures would not have taken place. You have brought into this campus big names like Kosuke Kayoma, Samuel Escobar, George Pebawi, Eddie Gibbs, Ave Adokami, and this year you've brought Doug Priest to deliver the lectures of the church. Doug Priest is a famous missionary leader. He took that position after serving in the mission field as a long-term missionary in Kenya and in Tanzania. In fact, Doug and his wife Robin served as missionaries in Kenya among the Maasai in the Loita Hills from 1978 up to 1984. And then after that, he also worked as a research, uh, per, uh, did research and assessment and moved to Singapore where they served as a uh, to coordinate the Asia mission for the CMF and uh, opened the door for some uh, of the mission work in different places like Ukraine and Thailand. Doug Priest speaks through experience, those many years of experience, so his leadership is valuable as he reaches the world. Doug Priest is also a publisher. He's written um, Doing Theology with the Maasai that was published in 1990. I've used that book several times. I value the uh, scholarship that went into it, especially with regard to the Maasai culture. He's also edited four mission books and to the uttermost that was published in 1984, The Gospel Unhindered, 1994, Get Your Hands Dirty, 2008, and The River of God, An Introduction to World Missions. He's also editor of the Missiology uh, of Alan R. Tippett series. And uh, so these resources are very valuable. He also, also directed us to another list of bibliography that he has used. I think that list is around here. Please do pick it up uh, before uh, you leave. So we are so delighted to have this family come here. Thank you, Doug, for starting those lectures on, on, on Tuesday and uh, introducing this new way of looking at mission, short-term missions, exploring all the angles a lot of churches have been involved in it. A lot of resources have been put into short-term term, uh, missions. And yet, we haven't really looked at it closely. And so, Doug Priest has helped us to understand the ramifications for these missions, 
to see the pitfalls of it and the advantages of it for those who go and those who, are, who, who receive these missions. So we're very delighted to, for him to come to the final lecture. We had questions yesterday and he referred us to this lecture. So we are waiting for those questions to be answered. Let's pray. We thank you, God, for your mission in the world. We thank you for Jesus that initiated this mission. And even before that, we thank you for your heart, your love, that initiated the mission to the world as an act of your love. And so we pray that as we extend your love through the special ministry of reaching others, that you will empower us through your spirit and guide us, give us, uh, guide our vision. We pray that our vision will be rooted in the gospel that Jesus presented and lived. And now as we receive our brother to give this final lecture, may you bless him and bless his ministry, his leadership with the CMF as it reaches out to the world. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Doug. Let me again begin by saying this morning how much fun that we are having here. Uh, you are such good hosts, uh, looking after our every need, and so we thank you for that. Robin and I tried to call our girls last night to tell them about the great time we're having here and to congratulate Nicole on the successful defense of her dissertation. Uh, you know, I'm not really good I don't have the best telephone skills. I, I might as well just say that. Uh, I was raised in Ethiopia during my high school years, and uh, maybe two or three times a year we would make a telephone call to the States. Uh, it often happened around Thanksgiving or Christmas time, and those conversations went like this. Hi, how are you? You sound so good. Are you having a good Christmas? It's kind of cold here. Hey, let me pass you to Louise so you can say hi to her. Then on to the next relative for the very same conversation over and over and over again. Because my parents were and are part of the greatest generation, they never talked a lot on the phone because it cost an arm and a leg to call the states from Ethiopia. So the conversations were very short. I still can't talk on the phone a long time. When I go overseas on a trip with somebody and they call their wife every day or so, I'm shocked. Robin might get a call every other week. <laughs> and all of this before the technology changed so much that you can talk for a ridiculously low figure for a lot of time on Skype. Calling to Kenya from America on your cell phone will set you back about a dollar or two a minute. But if you're in Kenya and you call America on a Kenya phone with a card, it takes about one cent a minute. The ease of communication is both a boon and a bane in short-term missions. You can keep up with those who contributed to your trip, though how much they really desire to hear and how often might be open to question. You can let your helicopter parents know that you are well, but the downside is that people can travel all this way, halfway around the world, and spend their time on Facebook and Instagram instead of spending time with the very people that they went to see. I think that if I were leading a short-term trip, I would probably insist that I personally hold all the cell phones and that they can only be used for about 15 or 30 minutes at the end of the day when we're back at the, the place where we're all staying. But the trouble is then people couldn't take photos so it probably wouldn't be a very good idea, come to think of it. Which brings me to our first topic in making short-term missions the best they can be, and an item to which I referred on Tuesday. In 2001, a group of short-term mission leaders from mission agencies, churches, and Christian colleges sensed that God was leading them to facilitate and formulate a set of standards or best practices for short-term missions. They gathered input from five mission networks and 400 mission leaders. There was a series of versions and the process lasted two full years. Sort of like writing a master's thesis. The resulting seven standards are the product of thousands of hours of work, discussion, and prayer. 
The seven principles that emerged as fundamental values or priorities for any short-term mission outreach include these seven values. And this morning, I was looking on my mail, my email, and I saw an announcement from the International Convention on Missions, and I saw that you can go to a pre-conference on these seven foundational principles. They formed an organization where they go around and they talk about these principles, and you can go there for a seven-hour meeting and you pay $50 to hear these principles. You get it in five minutes for free. <laughs> First principle, God-centeredness. An excellent short-term mission trip first seeks God's glory and his kingdom. It is centered on God's redemptive purposes and love for all nations and modeled after Christ's mission to the world. Second, empowering partnerships. A good trip establishes healthy, interdependent, ongoing relationships. This refers to one of the questions that we were talking about yesterday at lunch. Ongoing relationships between sending and receiving partners, sustained by a willingness to grow together serving God. These relationships are characterized by a primary focus on the needs of the receiving partners, open communication, humility, mutual trust, and accountability resulting in plans which benefit all the participants in the kingdom of God. So, in other words, the short-term trip is not conceived by flipping a coin and deciding which country we'll go to. Number three, mutual design. Each outreach will be collaboratively planned and will include service activities which are aligned with both partners' long-term strategies and goals. Those going should place themselves in humble, servant, teachable positions in submission to the leadership of both partners. Number four, comprehensive administration. This is needed to glorify God and be good stewards of time, talent, and funds. Honesty is foremost in all publicity, management of finances, and reporting of results. Appropriate risk management is implemented to remove unnecessary danger. Proper logistics are important while remaining receptive to the Holy Spirit's direction and changing circumstances. Number five, qualified leadership. An excellent short-term mission screens, trains, and develops capable leaders for all participants who possess the character, competency, and commitment needed for each particular outreach. Leaders exhibit spiritually mature servant leadership, are well prepared, and possess appropriate organizational and intercultural skills. They also value equipping and empowering others and are committed to an interdependent team approach to ministry and partnership. Number six, appropriate training. A good trip prepares and equips all participants to be effective in the mutually designed outreaches for the planned service and culture. Training is ongoing throughout all three phases, pre-field, on the field, and post-field, and is performed by qualified trainers. Relevant training benefits all participants, fostering understanding, growth, and spiritual fruit while helping to prevent offense, damage, and poor stewardship. Seven, finally, thorough follow-up. An excellent short-term mission assures debriefing, and appropriate follow-up for all participants. Debriefing means on-field re-entry preparation and includes post-field follow-up to apply lessons learned and promote continued growth and commitment to Christ and his world. Now, as you hear these principles, maybe your eyes glazed over. Perhaps you can see why I made the comment, for every waking hour that you spend on the field, you should spend five hours in preparation. That also includes post-field times. Listen, it's no small thing to use God's resources for our mission efforts. This is a big deal. Mission is important. This is serious stuff. We dare not take lightly short-term mission. 
Short-term mission must be viewed as much more than a personal discipleship activity for the people in our churches and youth groups. We want our trips to be the very best that they can possibly be. So what can we do to make our trips better? The beneficial or detrimental dynamics of these trips is largely, if not wholly, dependent upon the training of the participants and the administration of the event. We must pay attention and answer important questions such as which educational practices must take place? Who are the best teachers? How is the curriculum for the short-term trip determined? How is the agenda for the activities <laughs> determined? Some important pre-field activities include spending time studying the history, economics, politics, and spiritual context of the community where the activities will take place. And if possible, utilizing locals from the country before we ever go to the country to give us instruction about the country. This background learning also takes place on the field. Spend time talking to the leaders of the community, Christian or non-Christian, about the problems, solutions, and initiatives already at work. Present visits to a museum or a monument or an educational institution or a natural site as part of the trip rather than as just tourism apart from ministry. You heard me say that to prepare for missionary service, I took a university degree in cultural anthropology. I believe that next to biblical and theological studies, there is no more important field of study for missions than anthropology. At the time, I wasn't even thinking about the importance of this discipline for anything but long-term service. By the way, I want to give a shout out here to Milligan and to Emmanuel for the important role they played in missiological education. In 1974, Milligan and Emmanuel hosted a conference for missiologists, the William Carter Symposium, which resulted in the publication of a book, Crystal Paganism or Indigenous Christianity, edited by Milligan's Ted Yamamori and Emmanuel's Charles Tabor. A committee had been selected prior to this conference to make some curricular suggestions for the teaching of missiology. Their work was printed in the Milligan Missiogram, a journal that lasted but a few years. I want to quote for you the Milligan Consultation Resolution written by my mentor, Alan Tippett, in what I consider to be the most important article that ever came out of that journal. Of course, I'm biased. Here is the statement. The training of cross-cultural missionaries for the changing times and conditions of the mission fields in the world in our day requires more and more understanding and empathy. For many years, the discipline of anthropology, especially such aspects as social and applied anthropology, acculturation, cultural dynamics, the phenomenology of religion and ethnolinguistics, has been inadequately utilized in the majority of educational institutions where missionaries are trained. With the availability of this kind of education in our day, the sending forth of missionaries untrained in anthropology is no longer justifiable. We recognize that the missionary situation in the world has changed dramatically since World War II and that the old methods need revision and the training provided for missionaries needs to be more relevant to the new situations. This requires a re-evaluation of missionary methods and a reconsideration of fields of concentration in any missionary training curriculum. Stephen Yerbola, who teaches at Asbury Seminary, said much the same thing 35 years later. I believe the conceptual tools of cultural anthropology, holism, the native's point of view, and reflexivity can help those going on short-term mission trips to more fully appreciate the role that local culture plays in how people understand everything around them, including foreign missionaries. It can also help them understand the role their own culture plays and how they give meaning to the world around them, including the world of Christianity. A key feature of culture is that it categorizes others and us into in-groups and out-groups. We see ourselves as us and those we visit as them. We tend to identify everything about the in-group, us, as being normal, the way things ought to be done. 
Consequently, whenever we encounter people doing things a different way, we tend to see their action not just as different, but as deviant, even as wrong. So the first step to cultural flexibility is to understand your own culture and how it affects your interpretation of the behavior of others. I can hear the question, Doug, are you suggesting that anybody going on a short-term mission trip take a college-level course in cultural anthropology? Because if you are, good luck with that. No, I'm not suggesting that. Though, if one is going to be leading short-term mission trips, taking such a course, or at least reading in the field, would be of immense help. But we can dabble in anthropology or intercultural studies because there's a lot that can be mined there for us as we engage in short-term missions. And a good place to begin is with a theoretical model called cultural intelligence. Everybody is aware of IQ, intelligence quotient. That idea has been expanded to include EQ, emotional intelligence, and now CQ, cultural intelligence. Cultural intelligence incorporates the capacity to interact effectively across cultures. Thomas and Inkson define the term. Cultural intelligence means being skilled and flexible at, about understanding a culture, learning more about it from your ongoing interactions with it, and gradually reshaping your thinking to be more sympathetic to the culture and your behavior to be more skilled and appropriate when interacting with others from the culture. The whole purpose of enhancing our cultural intelligence is to use it as a way to be better at loving God and loving others. If missions is what we were created to do, and if we're to be the physical presence of Christ in the world, then working on how best to embody him to the world should be of prime importance. That's the essence of cultural intelligence for missions. So let's look at this cultural intelligence model a little more closely. There are four components of cultural intelligence. Knowledge, CQ. Interpretive, CQ. Perseverance, CQ. And behavioral, CQ. Knowledge, CQ simply refers to our understanding about cross-cultural issues and differences. Knowledge CQ is not primarily about mastering the do's and don'ts of a particular culture. Instead, it's understanding the rudimentary dynamics and differences that exist between cultures. Knowledge CQ focuses on cultural differences in five important areas. Number one, event time versus clock time. Number two, high context versus low context. High context refers to places where people have a lot of history together. Three, individualism versus collectivism or communal orientation. Four, power distance, which refers to how far apart leaders and followers feel from one another. And five, uncertainty avoidance, which means the extent to which a culture is at ease with the unknown. For these five areas, numerical scales have been drawn up so that you can compare one culture or country with another one. Of course, within a, cult within a country, there are many subcultures or cultural variation. We had an intern with us in the summer of 19, uh, in the mid-1980s. We lived in the city of Dodoma in Tanzania, right next to a very small uh, airport. Missionary Aviation Fellowship had a hangar at that airport, and when one of their planes landed, uh, I sometimes would walk down the street uh, half a block and then just walk right onto the airport. This is back before they had fences around airports. Just right onto the airport and help them unload the plane. It was a chance to get out of the house and say hey to some fellow missionaries. At MAF, I met an Indian guy named Beepin. He worked there as an accountant. He often came over to our house. One day, the intern and Beepin came over, were there for dinner. It was just the three of us because Robin and our two girls were away visiting somebody. I was getting the meal ready and asked Steve, the intern, if he would use the can opener and open the can that I was using for part of the dinner. Steve had finished his freshman year of college and was about 6'5". He played basketball. 
I picked him up at the airport in Dar es Salaam, and as we drove, begin the drive to our house, he saw lots of people standing along the road and walking. He asked me, are these people just hanging out? I laughed and said, no, they're going to work, purchasing things along the side of the road, and there are so many of them because they walk to work, and most of them don't have cars. That's why you see so many of them. He was surprised at that. Then, because he was into basketball, he next asked me, these guys look in pretty good shape. Do they work out? <laughs> I tried not to laugh, but answered him that they walk everywhere they go. They work hard, and many of them don't have a lot to eat, so they look like they're in pretty good shape. My guess is that practically none of them work out. So Steve's knowledge CQ was not high, but he was doing the right thing in making observations and asking questions. Anyway, back to the dinner with Steve and Beepin. Steve went into the kitchen, and a few minutes later, I asked if he had the can opened. He came back where we were sitting and sheepishly said, I don't know how to use a can opener. My eyes got big, and he went on. In our house, we have an electric can opener. Then Beepin's eyes got really big. I couldn't believe Steve didn't know how to use a can opener. Steve couldn't believe we didn't have an electric can opener because obviously we had electricity in the house. Beepin couldn't believe that there was such a thing as an electric can opener. Beepin was quite sophisticated. He hung around foreigners and airplane mechanics. He had never even heard of an electric can opener, which he thought was ridiculous. The second component of cultural intelligence is interpretive CQ. Interpretive CQ is simply the degree to which we're mindful and aware when we interact cross-culturally. It's turning off the cruise control we typically use when we interact with people, and it means intentionally questioning our assumptions. Interpretive CQ is the ability to connect our knowledge with what we're observing. It's developing the awareness to see and interpret cues from our cross-cultural encounters. It's all about making connections between what we know and what we are seeing and experiencing. Interpretive CQ follows a three-step process. First, interpretive CQ leads us to plan our cross-cultural interactions. Second, interpretive CQ begins to work itself out through a keen sense of awareness during cross-cultural interaction. Some people are naturally more observant than others, but all of us can grow in our ability to watch for cues sent by people and events we encounter in another culture. And then third, checking and monitoring is when we compare what we planned with what's really happening. Some call interpretive CQ mindfulness. Mindfulness is basically paying attention to context. It means simultaneously, one, being aware of your own assumptions, ideas, and emotions, as well as the selective perception, attribution, and categorizations that we adopt. Two, noticing what is apparent about the other person and tuning in to their assumptions, work, and behavior. Three, using all of the senses in perceiving situations rather than just relying on, for example, hearing the words that the other person speaks. Four, viewing the situation from several perspectives, that is, with an open mind. Five, attending to the context to help us interpret what's happening. Six, creating new mental maps of other people's personalities and cultural backgrounds to assist us in a, responding appropriately to them. Seven, seeking out fresh information to confirm or disconfirm the mental maps. And eight, using empathy the ability mentally to put ourselves in another person's shoes as a means to understanding the situation and their feelings towards it from the perspective of their cultural background rather than our own. When I was growing up as a kid in Ethiopia, my father would occasionally go hunting for forest hogs. It meant going out in the afternoon after work. He'd been taken to an area by a man named Gobana, and they had actually seen some pigs, but they didn't get one. The next day, my dad asked Gobana if he would take us to the area again, 
But Gobana said that since the next day after that was a holiday, he needed to wash his clothes so he could not go hunting. So my dad and I went by ourselves. We drove to the area. We began walking through the heavy undergrowth. And it was very difficult to see very far. And those hogs can run right over you. Uh, if they know you're there, they can just pew, come right out and run over you if you're kind of creeping along the ground. Dad, as we were creeping, happened to look up in a tree, and there was Gobunna with his rifle. My dad got angry, and he asked Gobunna why he had lied to him about washing his clothes for the holiday. Dad said, if you wanted to hunt without us, all you had to do was say so. We would have understood that. Here's the thing. In many cultures of the world, where we worked in Ethiopia being one of them, people do not have the same understanding of truth that we do. Gobana would have lost face if he said he wanted to hunt without us in the area where he knew there were pigs. So he said something that would be acceptable to us. Had we not gone hunting in that area on that day, we would have never known Gobunta went hunting there. He was acting according to the dictates of his culture. We were acting according to the dictates of our culture. It wasn't a lie. It was more like having a stomach ache or a headache and replying, feeling great, when somebody asks us how we're doing. <laughs> Component three is Perseverance CQ. Perseverance CQ refers to our level of interest, drive, and motivation to adapt cross-culturally. It's a traveler's robustness, courage, hardiness, and capability to persevere through cultural differences. If you've set about learning to speak another language, you know that there are times when it seems you're just making no progress. We call these plateaus. You have to push through and continue working on it, and then one day you'll realize you've gone forward and now you understand more than you used to. You can say more than you could, and people seem to understand you better than they did before. Perseverance CQ is the most important aspect of selecting people for cross-cultural work, including short-term mission work. The way one anticipates and is motivated to participate in a short-term project directly influences how the individual experiences the trip. Motivation shapes cross-cultural engagement more than anything else. There is a saying that reflects Perseverance CQ. You'll get as much out of it as you put into it. The final component of cultural intelligence is behavioral CQ. Behavioral CQ is the extent to which we change our verbal and nonverbal actions when interacting cross-culturally. Behavioral CQ is being sensitive and appropriate with our actions as we engage in a new culture. A young American man devoted a lot of attention to a young Japanese woman visiting his community, including extreme courtesy, taking her arm to cross the street and so on. The young woman later told her friends back home in an excited telephone call that she now had an American boyfriend. <laughs> in fact, the American was from the deep south of the United States where many families pride themselves on effusive courtesy. He was not interested in the Japanese woman as a prospective girlfriend. He merely tried to be polite in a manner that came naturally to him and his in-group. Unfortunately, the same type of behavior practiced by a member of the Japanese woman's in-group would definitely have been considered evidence of a romantic interest. It's possible to excel in one of the areas of CQ, knowledge CQ, interpretive CQ, and perseverance CQ, but not to do well in the others. The result is, as would be expected, not a very high CQ. One must develop expertise in all the components of cultural intelligence to become culturally intelligent. The whole process is one of synergy between the components. The three elements of cultural intelligence, knowledge, interpretation, and perseverance, are vitally important. But at the end of the day, our cultural intelligence, and more importantly, our short-term endeavors will be measured by our behavior. The things we actually say and do and the ways we go about our work become the litmus test for whether we're doing short-term missions with cultural intelligence. Social learning involves attention to the situation, 
retention of the knowledge gained from the situation, reproduction of the behavioral skills observed, and finally, reinforcement, receiving feedback about the effectiveness of the adapted behavior. Cultural intelligence does not occur in a vacuum, nor does it occur in a library, nor in hanging out with only the fellow members of your short-term missions trip, but in ongoing interaction with people of another culture. Let me summarize this. Cultural intelligence has three parts. First, the culturally intelligent person requires knowledge of culture and of the fundamental principles of cross-cultural interactions. This means knowing what culture is, how cultures vary, and how culture affects behavior. Second, the culturally intelligent person needs to practice mindfulness, the ability to pay attention in a reflective way and a creative way to the cues in the cross-cultural situations encountered. Third, based on knowledge and mindfulness, the culturally intelligent purpose person develops behavioral skills and becomes competent across a wide range of situations. And now, as promised to Dr. Elolia, those on the receiving end of short-term missions. The majority of the material that we've presented in our three days of lectures revolves around those going on short-term mission trips. We've explored how to make the trips the best that they can be for the participants. We've explored selection and training for the travelers. What we've not spent a lot of time on is those who receive the short-term mission trips, those who pretty much have to receive us, rearrange their schedules for us, and host us. What do they really think about short-term trips? It's important to hear what those on the receiving end have to say about short-term missions. Now, let's not be disingenuous here. Many people around the world fully understand that hosting short-term mission trips provides a direct link to material resources for their ministry. The resources are not only in helping to construct buildings or leaving behind worship instruments or sports equipment. Oftentimes, the result of the short-term trips is that the participating church decides to put the mission in the church budget. Put bluntly, some realize that without short-term teams, they will not be able to grow their ministry and in some cases even take care of their families. So yes, we acknowledge this reality. Sometimes, in our lack of understanding of other cultures, we believe we are personally loved by those we visit when in fact we are equally as loved for the material resources that we bring and provide access to. Everybody involved in mission and Christian higher education is involved in promotion, for we all live off the largesse of those who believe in us and in our causes. And unfortunately, there are hustlers out there just as there are hustlers here. The January 2014 issue of International Bulletin in their annual status of global mission has a line entitled Ecclesiastical Crime. They estimate that in mid-2014, ecclesiastical crime will amount to $39 billion annually, while the income of global foreign missions will be $35 billion annually. If we participate in short-term missions, let's do so with eyes wide open. In a small sample of interviews collected in Ghana and Rwanda, one researcher found that the four missionaries interviewed tended to feel that the young people they saw engaging in short-term missions tended to be culturally insensitive and a burden to the missionaries. The local church leaders interviewed were more positive than the missionaries, but had some reservations of their own. They felt the students were good construction workers and that they drew lots of attention to the local ministries because of their white skin. On the other hand, they felt that the short-termers should not focus on evangelism due to the lack of time to do it well. They wished the short-term missionaries had learned more about the host culture. And they wished the short-termers had spent more time with the locals rather than just with each other. Dr. David Zach Niringie, assistant bishop of the Kampala Diocese of the Anglican Church in Uganda, affirmed the call of many short-term mission reformers to reorient these trips around listening as opposed to projects or activities. 
In response to the question of how short-term mission travelers can best engage Ugandan Christians, the bishop answered, It's very simple. Come and be with us with no agenda other than to be with us. If God's mission is the reunification of all things to himself, including the restoration of fellowship within the church and among people everywhere and with his creation, then any time spent listening to local leaders or visiting with villagers is as legitimate a part of short-term mission as is building a house, performing a mime, or leading a VBS. Other local leaders said that it would be more appropriate to change the name from short-term mission to short-term opportunities. That may be more apt, but to leave off the term missions leads donors to feel they're being asked to pay for a vacation rather than a mission trip, so it's not going to happen. What these national leaders are proposing is more than a simple change in terminology or better preparation. They point to the fundamental institutional arrangements of these trips. They're initiated by North Americans, either located in North America or connected with North American missionaries in receiving countries. The funding is controlled by North Americans. And in response to these funding needs and cultural context, the trips are conceptualized in accordance with a missionary model of action and exchange. Without changing these structures of short-term missions, changing the cultural dynamics and the narratives, short-term mission may be an exercise in futility. While the short-term short leaders are ultimate, what they're ultimately advocating is a reorganization of power in short-term mission relationships. Are we willing to go on their terms, or are we willing only to go on our terms? Can these different viewpoints come together so that short-term missions can be a win for everybody? That's a key question going forward in short-term missions, or at least it should be. The trip is over, the team is back home, settling into their life, and perhaps already talking about their next short-term trip. I cannot state strongly enough that one of the key components of the trips is the debriefing that occurs once back home. For many of the travelers, these trips become a key moment for developing interpretations of social conditions such as economic inequality, cultural difference, racial dynamics, gender discrimination, globalization, and social injustice. Asking short-term mission participants to reflect on the experiences of others is a doorway to the possibility of considering social inequality in the world. Reflection on the experience of others may help the participants confront the privilege and power they have as travelers from the developed Western world over those in the developing world. Leaders should ask, did the trip itself contribute to an understanding of the political and economic context producing inequalities within and between nations? Gayla Congdon is a woman who founded Amore Ministries, and it's likely that some of you have participated with Amore on a short-term mission trip. She says that debriefing should include these elements, a look backward, at what happened to you emotionally, spiritually, physically, and socially. A present look at what you believe has changed and what you have become. If you have changed, how have you changed? Can others see the change in you that you believe occurred? A look into the future to determine where you will go from here and what you will decide to do as a result of this experience. I mentioned Tuesday that I believed everyone going on a short-term mission trip should read at least two books. One I have already named, When Helping Hurts, by Corbett and Fickert. Much of what we have tried to do with our short-term mission trips and even other mission efforts has led to unhealthy dependency. This book will revolutionize your thinking. The second book is new to me. I just read it in January but it's moved onto my list of favorites for those going on short-term missions. 
The book is entitled Foreign to Familiar, A Guide to Understanding Hot and Cold Climate Cultures. It's written by a woman named Sarah Lanier. Her thesis is that cultures are either hot or cold, and even that is true to a, in a literal sense of the term. The cold cultures are usually North American and European cultures, while the hot cultures are from warmer climates, generally the very places we visit on our short-term mission trips. People act differently in hot cultures than they do in cold cultures, and when the two interact, loads of misunderstanding can take place. The book's a short one, only 128 pages and in large font. It would be great as a study book for a, a group going on a trip or even for the individual who will be traveling. It provides all sorts of anthropological information without even using the term. It's easily understood and it helps explain why people from differing cultures often misunderstand one another. Recall the man from the Deep South and the woman from Japan who thought she now had an American boyfriend. Lanier's chapters are set up uh, as representing a continuum, relationship versus task cultures, direct versus indirect communication. Remember Gobana and the forest hog incident? Individual versus group identity and so on. Each chapter ends with a summary. To give you an idea, let me just show you her points from the chapter on relationships versus task orientation. Hot climate cultures are relationship-based. Communication must create a feel-good atmosphere. Though individuals may be otherwise, the society is feeling-oriented. Efficiency and time do not take priority over the person. It is inappropriate to talk business upon first arriving at a business meeting or making a business telephone call. Now the contrast, cold climate cultures, ours for most of us, are task oriented. Communication must provide accurate information. Though individuals may be otherwise, the society is logic oriented. Efficiency and time are high priorities and taking them seriously is a statement of respect for the other person. In conclusion, doing short-term missions right is not for the faint of heart, but it can be done well. I leave you with the words of David Livermore. We cannot truly serve those we do not know and love. However, as we enter into deep relationship with those we serve, we, in a small way like Jesus, take on others' burdens as our own and through authentic relationships, begin to truly lay down our lives so that those we serve might encounter the life of Jesus. Thank you. I can't say now tomorrow. <laughs> but I will, I will help those so you don't fight. Mm -hmm. I will try to moderate so that uh, who should be asking the question first. Yes. And then Paul. Going back to your uh, study of the CQ and the behavioral part specifically, um, does the locus of who is sending and who is receiving determine what's appropriate there? The question is, uh, who determines what is appropriate behavior? Those going or those receiving? Uh, both. Both is the answer to that question. Both those going and those receiving uh, determine appropriate behavioral CQ. But 
it's, it's inherent upon those going as much as possible without sinning to adapt the customs of the people that they're going to. We go and fit into their uh, culture and society rather than we're going and expect them to have to fit into ours. Uh, the, your good friend Greg Johnson, with whom you grew up basically, right, in Ethiopia, he, uh, he told me one time in Kenya that uh, he had, when, when he was working with the Maasai, that sometimes they would have visits from cultural anthropologists and scholars from the West. And uh, their cultural intelligence was lopsided. You know, they, they were so loaded up with knowledge of the culture, it's almost like they knew more about the culture than the people in the culture. And, and the, the reverse side of it was they were so incredibly naive. You know, of course, a lot of them didn't speak the language, and you know, they, they were awkward in their interaction. It, it, it's, it's an odd thing because, I mean, in a sense, it, it, it sounds to me like, I mean, you're preaching to the choir as far as education for cross-cultural mission. You know, that's, that's not a problem. But is there a danger in overburdening people so that some of that sort of innocence and naivete is lost, which may actually be a positive factor in its own life in cross-cultural communication? The question is, uh, is, is it possible for, for you to have too much anthropology such that you... Uh, don't really identify with the people or what you perceive in the people uh, is may not act, be actuality or be actual fact. Uh, I met some of those same anthropologists. One of them was a woman and uh, the Maasai wear beads and colored beads and uh, she had all kinds of theories about what those colors meant and what they were symbolic of and I, to me, uh, I'd lived there for a lot of years, and I had training in anthropology. I'd never heard anything like that, and I spoke the language uh, and was keen at collecting customs and stuff like that. So I asked the Maasai, I said, I asked them about that, and they didn't have a clue that this, that means that? No idea about that. So it is possible, it is possible to read into a situation more than is really there. That's why I think, I think some of the best anthropologists are missionary anthropologists because they stay a long time, generally. Uh, whereas most anthropologists, in, this is the traditional model, you, you get your undergraduate and your graduate coursework, you go out and you spend a year doing an ethnography, then you come home and you write your dissertation and you get your book published, then you go get a job at a university and live off of that year for the rest of your life. Maybe you make visits to some other places or repeat visits. Uh, missionaries have a much better chance than that because they live there for a long period of time. Yeah, I do think it's possible. One of the main tenets of anthropology is called cultural relativism, which means you don't judge a culture based on your merits, you judge a culture culture based on its own merits. So let the culture judge itself, not you judge the culture. And it, it is possible that uh, anthropologists are so filled up with that that they just will not allow anything to be changed. They have to look at it uh, as if everything is okay, there's nothing wrong, uh, because this is how it fits and works in their culture. And of course, we uh, do not believe that. We believe that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so that's, that's a main difference between us and secular cultural anthropologists. I guess on the flip side, if we wanted to know more about this CQ, uh, would that be found in those two books? Could you repeat those two books? And if they aren't there, where can we find them? Uh, okay. The question is, where do we find out more about cultural intelligence? Have I got a deal for you? <laughs> right down in that bookstore on the books that they're trying to sell because they're not used anymore, so they marked the price down. Livermore's book, David Livermore's book, is called Serving with Eyes Wide Open. It was $11, now it's $8. That's right down there. There's only one copy, so stay out of the way of the door on the way down there. Okay, the second book, uh, let me see if I have it. I don't remember who the first author was. The second one was Inkson, but let me look here real quick. 
Uh, by the way, th these are in this bibliography that are right over there for you to pick up. So you don't have to copy it down. You can just find it on there. Is it Towson? Thomas and Inkson, Cultural Intelligence. Duh. <laughs> <laughs> Who gets the last word? Yes, sir. Do you find the enthusiasm being greater for external missions as opposed to internal missions? The question is, do you find the enthusiasm directed towards external missions to be greater than that towards internal missions or perhaps vice versa? Uh, I don't know why this was the case, uh, but missions was always defined historically for the last 200 years as us going to them. And that would be the Western countries going to the rest of the world. In the last 20 years, uh, there's been the realization that missions occurs everywhere. And it's no longer us going to the rest, it's everybody going everywhere. And so I think the word missions in some ways uh, is not even a, a useful word anymore because most people think that means uh, me taking off and going to live and minister in Kenya and it doesn't mean me going downtown or going to another state uh, or another county. That for some reason, that's not considered missions. Uh, I don't agree with that. Missions is from everywhere to everywhere, and it should be. That's what I think. I do sense, I do sense uh, in many of our churches uh, a renewed emphasis on working here in America, amongst all cultures here in America. And I'm very grateful for that, and uh, I think that needs to be the wave of the future, as well as the present. Can you join? Thank you, please. Can you put your shoes on? <laughs> well, um, this is. Uh, uh, we want to thank uh, Dirk and his wife for. Coming to us with these great lectures. We appreciate what you've done here and also spending time with our students uh, since Tuesday and also in our community. Uh, please uh, do come again and again. Most people uh, when you're lecturing, uh, just come to listen to that and hang out with us. And, uh, so we're going to pray, that's another word of prayer for them as they um, continue with their work and then. Uh, we thank you, God, for this couple. We thank you for the way you've called them into your vineyard to serve you uh, in Ethiopia, in Kenya, Tanzania, and also in Singapore. Now, in their leadership roles, I pray that you continue to guide them as they impact so many young people uh, traveling to different parts of the world, campus ministries, and all the varieties of missions that come under the rubric of our Church Missionary Society, the CMF. We pray, O oh God, that uh, this will, that their work will shine in the world, and that uh, people will be drawn to you as they meet Jesus. May you bless them, and guide them, as they go back uh, to, to 